Annunciation Latin class. Capitulum predecem annus et menses par secunda. Let's uh, start oratio initialis. In nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Okay. Um, today is the feast of, our, in English, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, or in Latin, Nostra Mater de Perpetuo Sucurusu. Um, so we'll um, talk a little bit about it. And the prayer that is most associated with Our Lady of Perpetual Help, the Memorare. And then we will get to chapter 13. So... Um, you guys, we may not get to chapter 13 by the time we're all done, but that's okay. We have good stuff along the way here. Um, so, Hodie est festum nostre matris de perpetuo sucurusu, or sucur in, in English. Literally, it's Our Lady of Perpetual Sucur. And if you look in older English prayer books, that is what you will see or older English language, that is. Uh, more commonly today, we say Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Uh, whoever uses the word sucker anymore in English uh, or sucker, I'd say it. I guess it's sucker in English, isn't it? Long U. Um, anyway, the um, title derives from an inscription that once appeared above at door in the Augustinian Church of San Mateo. San Mateo. Oh, there's, there's, there's uh, Teresa. Excellent. Um, and I'll tell you why the Augustinian Church of San Mateo is important in a minute here. But uh, Dei Pare Mater et Virginis Sucurusu Perpetui. So Dei Pare is the... Um, uh, li uh, literally, um, um, uh, the God-bearer, so the mother of, of God, sorry, um, come on, brain, uh, so the mother of God and virgin of perpetual help, and so we know it today as, as that, um, I'm sure everybody's seen the icon in Annunciation. Uh, it is a copy. The original um, icon, which is 15th century origins, uh, originally was enshrined in the Church of San Mateo, or St. Matthew in English, uh, in March of 1499. Yeah, we were, uh, yeah, Teresa, we were beginning to wonder if you'd been kidnapped by aliens. Um, sort of would kind of fit in with your whole week. Um, and today it's in the church of St. Uh, Alphonsus of Liguri in Rome, uh, where the novena to Our Lady of Perpetual Help is prayed every week. Uh, today, as I said, is the feast day. Um, Pope Pius X granted a pontifical degree of canonical coronation, along with its title uh, on May 5th of 1866. So while the icon and the devotion have been around for, oh, at least 500 years, and then some, uh, the current icon, and, and uh, or not the icon, but the, the Our Lady of Perpetual Help is, is a newer sort of uh, devotion you know, in the sense of, um, the name is is more recent. And so um, anyway, in Eastern Orthodoxy, th this is actually a copy of, of Eastern icons. It's known as the version of the Passion. And you say, why the, the, vir the virgin of the Passion? And the reason is, is uh, the Christ child here is looking very concerned because the angels are carrying the instruments of his Passion. 
Uh, this is the cross is in a Byzantine form. It is, after all, an icon. And these are the nails and some of the other things that are symbols of his passion. So uh, it's, um, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a very poignant icon as to what the future is. Um, the icon comes from the 15th century Crete, and it's likely a copy of an older icon. Um, the exact details are disputed of the, or, of the origins. There are several historical claims. Uh, one theory, which fits nicely, is that this copy was actually painted by uh, Andreas Rizzo de Candida, who lived in the late uh, 15th century, well, who died in the late 15th century. He uh, was from Crete, but he lived and traveled in Rome during this time. He created a number of works that resembled that icon. Uh, we're not sure if he took it to Rome with him or if it had, was stolen in Crete. The, the, uh, uh, the usual tale or, st or story, history, sorry, it's not really tale. The usually historical account is that it was stolen while it was in Crete and taken to Rome. But we don't My know for sure. Yeah. Uh, and just just along those lines, uh, <clears throat> I received a, an email from uh, the National Sh Shrine of Immaculate Conception, and they say what you said that um, that it was stolen by a wine martin, a wine merchant, excuse me, a yes. few years <laughs> after its creation in 1495, and then brought to the Church of Saint Matthew in Rome. Yeah, most accounts have the theft. And then, and and uh, by a merchant, one has to wonder whether the word merchant here is loose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of like fences, they're merchants, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, or not, but yeah. Um, that, that, that was a muf euphemistic term. Yeah. Uh, yeah, applied, yeah. I, I I, I, or there's also pirates, they're merchants, they deal in sea trade, right? Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Yeah, um, there's a lot of indication that he may have painted it or written it more is the correct term if you're using Eastern Orthodoxy terms. They don't paint icons. They write them because they tell a story um, it, that it was uh, pilfered and uh, taken to Rome. There's another um, story, history. Uh, now, we do know the original icon and when I say original, the one that this was copied from, more or less, uh, is known as the Panagia Cardiotisa in Greek. And the name is due to the mother of God holding the child Jesus near her heart. Cardio, you know, heart. Okay. Uh, we know that icon was painted by Lazarus uh, Zografos who lived in the ninth century. And he either did it at or nearby where the Keras Car Cardiotisis Monastery is. Um, that's an Eastern Orthodox Mar uh, monastery dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And it is situated near the village of Kara in Crete. So, um, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And then the story goes that it was stolen from the monastery in 19, 1498 and taken to Rome. Um, so again, you know, acquired by traveling merchants <laughs> and taken to Rome. We do know that um, he may have painted the original, but we do know that the one that is now in Rome is not from the ninth century. Uh, that was uh, carbon dated, and I'll, I'll mention it in a later slide, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, late uh, 14th, 15th century. So uh, it was, it, whether it was actually writ um, written by this guy or not, we don't know. Uh, and But we do know that he did not do this particular copy. More than likely, this guy copied the original, and that's the one we have in Rome today. Um, we do know from about the end of the 15th century onward that the icon 
ended up in the church of San Mateo. The story goes that it was in the uh, possession of the merchant's family <clears throat> for uh, a number of years, and finally they wanted to donate it and have it enshrined in the church. There is a plaque there uh, that noted the dedication of its installation. And it stayed there for about 300 years, and it was simply referred to as Madonna di San Matteo, the Madonna of St. Matthew. Now, um, in the last years of the 18th century, the Church of San Matteo was staffed by the Augustinian order. Um, they'd been there for about 60 years. And war broke out in 1798, and Napoleon invaded Rome in 1799. And you may not be up on your European history, but let me tell you that that was, uh, in terms of uh, the religious artwork and, and uh, the Catholic Church, a disaster, because Napoleon and his general, Francois Messina, they carried off Pope Pius, whoops, I left out a Pius. I apologize. There we go. Pius VI off into exile, and they ordered the destruction of some 30 churches in Rome. And among those was San Mateo. And uh, real nice guy there, that Napoleon. The other thing that's often left out of stories is the French troops uh, basically uh, invaded convents and nunneries and uh, captured nuns and sold them as prostitutes. So that was another fun event of that little invasion of Napoleon. So good gosh. Yes. He was not a friend of the church. My God. <laughs> oh yeah. It, well, and it wasn't all his fault. Uh, this, I think a lot of this was also done under his, the general's orders, but you know, he was the top man in charge. So he, he could have done something to, uh, to a <laughs> Arm. Yeah, oh yeah, it was just terrible. But anyway, so the Church of San Mateo was destroyed, and a lot of people thought that the icon had been destroyed. But the Augustinian friars rescued the icon in advance of the destruction of the church by the French, and they took it to the nearby church of St. Eusebius. I don't know which Eusebius that is. I have to look that up someday. Uh, but later it got set up at a side altar in the church of Santa Maria in the Postarula. Uh, and it was kind of forgotten there uh, by everybody but the Augustinian flyers for about 65 years or so. Uh, you know, when you're being invaded and your churches are being burned and, you know, stuff like that, your priorities tend to kind of change a little bit and you get distracted. So, it's uh, not too surprised that it sort of got... got uh, also, I think the Augustinian friars did it on the sly. They didn't want, you know, the, the Napoleon's troops to, uh, you know, to um, uh, capture it. I mean, uh, just keep in mind that the Mona Lisa, which was painted by Leonardo da Vinci, which was an Italian artwork, is now in the Louvre. So, uh, um, you know, Hitler wasn't the only one that invaded places and uh, took art back for their own use. So uh, now, coincidentally and providentially, um, in January of 1855, the Redemptorist priest purchased the Villa Caserta in Rome, which is along the Via Merulana, and converted into their headquarters. You know, they, they were an up and coming uh, order and they needed, uh, hey, we, we, you know, we need a place. What they did not know is that had been the site of the Church of San Mateo that had been destroyed by Napoleon. Um, let's see, that was uh, what, uh, yeah, about uh, 50, 60 years before. And so um, decades later, uh, and I've forgotten the date, Pope Pius IX invited the Redemptor's Fathers to set up a Marian House of Veneration in Rome. And so uh, the Redemptorists, again, not knowing the history of the icon, or, or actually they, they, didn't, they thought the icon had been lost, they built the San Alfonso de Liguri, or St. Alphonsus Liguri, church oh, that, location. Michael? <laughs> yeah? When I looked up uh, San Mateo in Rome, what comes up 
when I Googled it was Sant Alfonso de Liguori, and I was yeah. confused. Yes. Thought, <laughs> what have I done wrong here? <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> Because that's now what's standing there. The original church had been destroyed. I think there was a little bit left standing. I, I don't think they quite got the whole thing. I don't know. Maybe they did. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the Redemptors built the uh, the, the St. Uh, Alphonsus Liguri Church in that purpose. So, and, and I said, coincidentally and providentially, there's a little more here. So what happened is uh, the icon had been pretty well forgotten about. Uh, but in 1863 to 1865, starting in 1863, actually, the icon was sort of rediscovered in the oratory of the Augustinian fathers. It had been, when I say oratory, it, it literally had been stuck in a side chapel and kind of uh, covered in you know, the access to that side cha uh, side chapel was was debatable. I mean, there was all sorts of stuff in the way, and and so uh, it kind of got neglected. Uh, but anyway, they they found it, and Pope Pius the tenth, sorry, the ninth, used to pray before the icon at San Mateo when he was a boy, and so when he uh, heard that it had been rediscovered. He uh, really took an interest in it. And so in a letter from, of uh, December 11th, 1865, to the Redemptress, uh, he ordered that Our Lady of the Perpetual Sucre should again be publicly venerated in the Via Merulana at the Church of St. Alphonsus. So it's back to where it originally was in 1944, sorry, 1490, sorry, try again, 1499. Um, and the icon has been there ever since. It just took a rather circuitous route and took a new church to be rebuilt for it to end up there. So um, anyway, the other thing was, is after, let's say, some rather rough, well, uh, several, a couple hundred years and rough handling, it was not in the best of shape. So uh, they did have it restored in 1866. Uh, it went under restoration by a Polish painter of the, by the name of uh, Leopold. Uh, ooh, let's see, is that Nowotny? Now won't, um, well, Leopold, leave it at that. And um, so it had been there, uh, oh, I don't know, over a uh, little over 100 years now. And so in 1990, uh, they took it down for another round of restoration uh, and photography, and uh, in particular, they were concerned about uh, fungal growth. Uh, I mean, it, it is on a wooden panel, so fungus is not a great thing. Uh, and this was done by the Vatican Museum, which are really experts in restoration of, of paintings, manuscripts, and artwork like this. And uh, while they had it, they did do a carbon-14 test, and so it was somewhere between the year of 1325 to 1480. So it's certainly not uh, part of the original uh, monastery. Let's see, where did I do that? Uh, oh yeah, this one. So it really was not done by him, although he probably did the original model that this guy probably painted from it. And then, uh, it was probably acquired late at night by a wine merchant and ended up in Rome. So, Michael, uh, mm -hmm. a question. Um, <clears throat> you said that um, Pope Pius IX used to pray before the icon at San Mateo when he was a boy. Yes. So he became interested in the rediscovery of the icon. Um, okay, I'm a little bit confused. Didn't, didn't Napoleon invade Rome in eight, 1798? Yes. And, okay, so if he was a little boy in 1865, it, it, the, the, those numbers don't add up. Well, uh, okay, 1798, let's round that to 1800. Right. So, and now we're talking 1865 uh, is when he writes this letter to uh, Father. Uh, you're Bernard. right. Well, let's see. How old was he then? That's a good question. I don't know when he was born. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is the way it's usually uh, stated, is it was Pius the Ninth. Well, let's see when Pius the Ninth was born, just for the heck of it. Uh, 
Pope. I can always get back to Pius the Ninth. Okay, when was he born? Oh, 1840. Whoop, hold on. Yeah, see, he was born in May of uh, 1792. So he would have been seven years old, maybe. So he was a little boy at this. Yeah. So in 1865, my goodness, uh, he was he was really old by the time. Yeah. Yeah. And he was pope until uh, 1878. So that would have been 78 wow. plus eight. He would have been 86 years old. So. Yeah, but in, I, I, it just occurred to me that he had to be pretty old at the time that he wrote that letter if he was a little boy yep. at the time that Napoleon invaded, but I guess so. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see. Anything else here? Uh, yeah, we did that. Now, um, why the 27th? Well, the 27th was the official date of translation to the Church of San Mateo in March of 1499. Um, Pope Pius IX selected June 27th, which was when the canonical coronation of the image at the new church occurred. And the Augustinians themselves suggested June 29th, or 27th, in part because of the association with March 27th, but also the fact that's when it was reinstalled. And somewhere in there, the ownership was transferred from the Augustinians to the Redemptorists. And that was sometimes when the church was enshrined at uh, St. Alphonsus Liguri, because that's, that's a Redemptist church, and still is for that matter. So um, that's uh, the history of the icon. Now, the Latin part is uh, the prayer most often associated is the Memorare. Uh, that has its own interesting history. And so um, you will sometimes see it attributed to St. Bernard of Clairvaux from uh, the, uh, what is that, 12th century, mm -hmm. 11th century, 12th century. Uh, certainly a famous guy. But no, <laughs> short answer, he did not write it. He does have a few of his passages that he's written that kind of follow the Memorare, but you know, the Memorare uh, has a lot of passages in it that you would see elsewhere. So it really doesn't necessarily mean much, but we do know that the prayer was first popularized, not by St. Bernard of Clairvaux, but another Bernard, namely Father Claude Bernard, who lived from 1588 to 1641. And he went around all over the place. Uh, he was had a very great devotion to Our Lady, and he promoted the prayer and uh, a lot of other things. Uh, I didn't want to list pages and pages of stuff that he did, but uh, if you're interested, um, look him up. There's a general uh, speculation that the Association of St. Bernard of Clairvaux sort of is a case of mistaken identity with Father Bod Bernard. So somewhere along the line, Father Bernard became St. Bernard. Oh, well, that must be St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And that's who wrote it. But no, he didn't. Maybe, uh, Saint, maybe Father uh, Claude will get canonized someday, and that'll take care of the whole problem. Uh, well, no, there's a thought. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a thought. Um, now, while we do have the origins of the prayer itself, while we do have Father Ber Claude Bernard to thank for promoting it, um, as I said, he didn't read, he didn't, he didn't write it. Uh, first off, Father Bernard stated he learned the prayer from his own father, and the pro prayer was known in, to and used by Saint Francis de Sales, who was twenty years older than Father Bernard, so it had been around for some time. Uh, before uh, Father Bernard got hold of it. Thirdly, and most importantly, the prayer appears as part of a much longer 15th century prayer, which called Ad Sanctitatis Tue Pedes Dulcissimo Virgo Maria in a work known as the Antidotarius Anime. Anyone who want to take a crack at what that means? 
we have had all of those words. <laughs> Something about to your holy feet, the most sweet Virgin Mary. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Exactly, and it's in a book called the Antidotarius Anime, which has all sorts of gems in it, and you can get reprints of it if you know where. Um, one of these days, I will talk about really great Latin prayer books you can get uh, and order through the internet, but they are all 100% Latin and not necessarily easy to read because the typeface, but that's where it is. It's in the Antidotarius Anime. And you're going to ask me if I, somebody needs to ask yeah, me. Yeah, by the way, I had, uh, when you were first looking at this book, I looked it up in Scriba Antido, Antido, uh, anti, Antidotum. It means an antidote against poison. Yes. That's yeah. the only, the only, the only uh, translation in Scriba. Yeah. So obviously there must be another one. <laughs> well, no, ant no, antidote for the soul. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It. What it is? Okay. This is an interesting book. Most prayer books, be they medieval books of the hours or whatever, are arranged. Oh, either according to the prayer hours, you know, terse, sex, nones, vespers, etc., or according to specific devotions or subjects. The Antidotarius Anime is like a giant doctor's book where the prayers or the subject of the prayers are listed alphabetically. So uh, it's kind of like uh, a book of plants, you know, would be listed alphabetically or something, or, or a dictionary would be listed alphabetically. It's an interesting book. So uh, anyway, and somebody needs to ask me, do I have a copy of this? <laughs> All right. I need a straight man or one. Do you have a copy of it? Thank you. Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I think the qu the correct question is, oh, you don't have a copy of that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, anyway, here is the Namorare. So I thought we would, I'll, I'll recite it once and then we'll try going through it together. Um, I actually pray this every day. In Latin? Oh, excellent. In Latin. Well, I have to read it, but yeah. In well, Latin. it's okay. That's okay. Uh, yeah. It, this is not hard grammatically. The difficulty is uh, most of the words in here you have not had yet. Uh, so... Uh, Piissima. I don't think we've had the word pius yet. Um, and let's see, uh, secolo you've had, uh, presidia you haven't had, um, although you can kind of guess what implorantum is and some of these others. But here, let I me picked up presidia from the St. Michael's Prayer. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And, and a lot of these are really, I mean, they make sense when you. Yeah. When you look at it, you, you figure it out. Cordero, we've had Cordero, I think. We've before. had Cordero. Adte so, Venio, yes. Yeah. Corante, uh, before the Gemens, uh, weeping. Peccator, sinner, assisto. So, um, yeah, there are some words in here, but let, let me uh, let me read this through first. The, the Gemens is reminiscent of Salve Regina. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Memorare o piissima Virgo Maria, non esse auditum a seculo, quemquam a tua carentem presidia, tua implorantem exilia, tua patentem suffragia esse derelictum. Ego tali animatus conferencia ad te Virgo Virginum, mater curo, ad te venio, coram te gemens peccator assisto. Noli mater verbi verba mea despicera, sed audi propitia et exaudi. Amen. And the English translation is fairly uh, fairly literal. Um, so anyway, you can add that in your uh, to your repertoire in in Latin. Sounds better when you read it. Uh, would, would but would piissima literally mean most pious? Yes. And the problem with the word 
pious is it has gotten thoroughly trashed by the English, um, <laughs> well, I hate to use the word reformation, but <laughs> you know what I'm referring to. Uh, the, the English abandonment of Catholic thought. Uh, pious has a sort of dirty word in today's um, society. In Latin, it means uh, duty, dutiful. Mm -hmm. But it is a duty born of love and affection, not duty like, hey, you get you get your jury duty notice and you go, oh, shoot, and you, you know, you got to go, you know, downtown duty as in a, uh, a, a command or a law or a rule. Rather, it is duty born of affection. So you will often see it translated as loving uh, at the end of the Salve Regina. Um, let's see. Da, da, okay. So, let's see. AI Avica Elos to us. Uh, o Clemens, O Pia, O Dulcis Virgo Maria. You'll see Pia translated as loving, which is close, but it doesn't quite capture it. So, the best way to think of it is. Um, you have a dutiful spouse. That doesn't mean you get to order your spouse around and she or he does everything you ask. It rather means that the, the spouse is concerned for your well-being and out of love, there is an exchange there of, of, um, uh, of things. So um, that's really what it means. Uh, and it's so opiissima is our superlative form. Pius is the pius pia pium is the uh, is the uh, what do they call it? positive form, and then piissima is the comparative form, which we just had in uh, yeah pia yesu yeah that's the other one. Uh, well, I mentioned that because I don't think there's any negative connotation associated with the pa in that beautiful. Um, that beautiful music. Oh, no, no, no. But I, what I'm saying is it, it was when they translated it into English. They fudged oh. on it because the word pious in uh, this society in the 21st, 20th, late 20th and early 21st century uh, has been sort of trashed. They all think of it as some sort of... Holier than thou kind of... Yeah, holier than thou or, or some... Um, Kind of eschewing the secular world for the for the holy, and it's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, but no, no, the uh, PAA su Domine is is a very nice piece, and others where that occurs. So there it is. Um, so actually, let us get to finally um, the lessons here. Okay. Come on. Now, you said you had a question, Alex. Why don't we take the question first, since that's probably in an earlier section, right? Okay. okay. Uh, I, I'm curious about, uh, in the text, um, it offers these explanations. I know that this kind of uh, narrow question, but it offers these explanations of... Um, Edus as being the 13th and the 15th of the month. And yes. of course, we know the Ides of March uh, uh, that con is connected with the 15th. Right. And, and the explanation they give is, well, some months are 30 days and some are 31. But that doesn't explain, in my thinking, the, the fact that it's a two-day difference. Yes. Yes. So maybe you could explain well, why they, that they say that it means edus means either the thirteenth or the fifteenth. Yeah, um, boy. If, if you uh, want to get to it later, no, no, it, no, no it, it bears repeating. It's too bad you weren't here for last week because we went into the calendar heavily. Well, if you did, then uh, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Probably bears uh, repeating. The earliest Roman calendar 
had only 10 months. Um, and March was the first month, spring, okay. Many of the Mediterranean cultures had a calendar that began in the spring, okay. For example, the Jewish calendar begins in the spring. Um, now, the Romans originally only had 10 months. Each month was approximately 29, or well, was uh, 29 or... 30 days because what okay most calendar the, the other thing they had besides the sun is they had the moon to keep time i'm getting ahead of myself so the lunar period from one full moon to the next full moon is 29 and a half days and so to make it come out even is one month might have 29 days and then the next month had 30 and then the next one 29 and the next one 30. So that it averaged out over time. And you said, well, 10 months isn't the whole year. You're right. The winter was just one long um, chunk of time. And what was it? The Mercatorum? Oh, what was that called? Mer... Uh, uh, Mercatorium or something like that? Mercedarius? No. Oh, Mercedaria? Uh, no, okay. I'll, Mercedonius? No. Oh, yeah. I think it, I... Yeah, that, that's right. It was the Mercedonius. Uh, <laughs> it was, um, no, I'm sorry. That was the intercalinary month. Um, I'm not sure what that thing was referred to as. I'd have to go back and look. When I Googled it last week, it was, uh, I, I looked up like, missing months in the Roman calendar or something like that. Uh -huh. And so anyway, uh, it was winter time and nobody cared about anything anyway. So they just sort of, it was a period of time. Well, somewhere probably in the second century BC, maybe a little bit earlier than that, but somewhere in there, um, they reorganized the calendar. January, well, first off, they created two new months, January and February. So now we have 12 months. And Janus, or Januarius, became the first month. And Janus, or Janus, was the god of portals uh, and a number of other things. So he was always seen as looking one way into the portal and the other way out of the portal, so to speak. And so he became the god, of, and all the, the months had Roman gods associated with him in some fashion. So even though if it wasn't necessarily named after him, as they point out, Januarius and Mars, uh, Januarius and Martus were the, um, were the named after Janus and Mars. So, uh, but they still needed to do the 28 and, or 29. And, and the other, okay, the other problem, of course, is that, uh, in fact, let me open that up. So that way I can remember all my great stuff that I told you guys. Uh, yeah, junior. Oh yeah. But you take 365 days, you divide by 29 and a half, you get the 12 months but you get 11 days left over. So what to do about those 11 days? And um, different cultures would simply add a leap month approximately every th three years to keep the sun and the lunar calendars synced. The Jews do that. Uh, periodically, they will have a leap month declared, and they will have 13 months in their year. And there's no, I, I believe there's a, uh, it, it's agreed upon by a series of priests or something. So it's not a nice, neat formula. Uh, you actually have to have the table of Jewish years and months in front of you historically in order to be able to figure out what a particular date maps into in our calendar. Uh, so anyway, there were 11 days, and they didn't just add 11 days or anything, because they wanted the, 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 the moon was a very nice timekeeper. Can I ask, so the rearranging of the months, that's why September is not the seventh month, it's Correct. the ninth month, Correct. but October is the tenth month. Yes. 
and it should um uh, yeah it, october is the 10th month it should be the eighth month that, and that's it, because they start you use they usually they used to start in march march it should yeah. be the first one yeah yeah okay uh, well, now they, eight. Octo yeah, Oct. they okay two more in there and originally uh july and august um Let's see, July would be, okay, September was seven, uh, August was six, um, July was fifth, was Quintilis, if I remember the name correctly, for five. And then August was uh, uh, Sextilis or something like that. I'd, I'd have to go back and get the exact name, but it was for five and six. Um, later, those got renamed for Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus, July and August, you know. But the um, at this point, you know, in the first century here, um, well, actually, oh, well, if it's late first century, they would have already made the change. Oh, in fact, oh, in fact, in the, they do say, uh, yeah, that's right. They do have the name of the month. Uh, okay, so this already, the change had already occurred at this point. So anyway, uh, periodically they would just add a leap month to keep it in uh, sync. And the Romans used to do this before the reform of Julius Caesar. Now, the problem was um, that leap month was declared by, I think it was by vote if I, of the Senate, if I remember correctly. Let me check my next. Uh, do, 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 do I mention it? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. I believe it was by the vote of the Senate. So the calendar could become a very political issue. Yeah, well, also, you know how well our Congress works. Well, <laughs> the Roman Senate wasn't much better most of the time. Uh, so um, uh, it that went for a number of years, like decades, without having that intercalinary month in. And so it got to the point where, you know, um, you know, uh, January was was in the middle of the summer or something. Yeah, Julius yeah. Caesar complained about it a lot. Yeah, he said, this is ridiculous. You know, we're, we're having our winter holidays and they had winter holidays, you know, in the middle of the summer. So um, Julius Caesar commissioned, and I don't recall the man, man's name, I believe he's an Egyptian astronomer, if I remember correctly. Because the Egyptians kept absolutely immaculate records of the rising of the planets and the setting and various other things. And he said, okay, look, the year is 365.25 days long, which is very close. And so he came up with what was known as the Julian calendar, which is essentially what we have now, I mean, with some changes. And so he established that, he set that down in 44 BC and as a trivia, sorry, 45 BC. And as a trivia question, you can ask people, what was the longest year in history? Everybody, yeah. says, huh? <laughs> and it must've been that transition year. Yes, that year was 444 days, 445 days long. Wow. I mean, that's, how, that's how far off the, the Roman calendar had gotten. So yeah, the, and, and it's a testament to how good this calendar was when he promulgated. So it's be, before, the, well, there's no year zero, but um, I don't know, what, 30 BC or 50 BC. Anyway, uh, that by the time the British finally, finally went on the Gregorian calendar, there were it was only off by like 11 days. And yeah. that's like... 1800 years later or something it yeah. was quite accurate yes it was so michael if i could intervene here sure it, 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 if i if i understand what you're saying is this business of it either the ides either being um the 13th or the 15th it depends on the calendar we're talking about is that right well no this this is true today okay but what happened I, i'm leading up to that is he had to distribute those 11 days somehow. Okay. And so some months were shorter than they are today. And so the 13th was roughly the middle of the month. Okay. So he had to add a number of days to some of the months to lengthen them. Okay. 
And so, um, but it still doesn't work. And February, I forget why February got shorted with 28 days. Uh, I mean, he could have taken a 31 day and move it over there. The reason July and August have 31 days now is because, hey, this is Julius. This is the month after Julius Caesar. He can't have a short month. So they set that to 31. Uh, Caesar Augustus, the, uh, you know, the first Roman emperor, they said, well, he can't have a short month either. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe they robbed February to give that an extra day in there. So originally it was closer to the middle of the month, but uh, that with all the calendar reforms and stuff, that is no longer true. So if you meant it, if you meant it in the sense of depending upon the calendar you're talking about, yeah, you're right. Uh, originally, it was uh, the way that, by virtue of the way the calendar worked uh, back there in uh, uh, 200 BC, roughly. Is that what you meant by it depends on the calendar? Well, it's my understanding that. Julius Caesar was killed on March the 15th. That is the Ides. That is correct. Okay. And so the Edus, um, uh, is it Marchie, I guess, uh, is the 15th of March. Yes. So, right. So that would be uh, the, the Ides of March with regard to the time period that Caesar was killed would have been the 15th. But sometime, sometime before that, uh, with a previous calendar, it would have been the 13th? That's no. what I'm... No, it was always the 15th. Okay. The Ides never moved in the month. They were always on... If it was a, if it was a 15th month Ides, it was always on the 15th. Okay, but in the... Okay. If it was a 13th month Ide it was always 13 in that month, despite all the calendar shifting around and adding and subtracting days. Oh, okay. You're what saying happened, for March. What happened is in the adding and subtracting, it was no lo it no longer was the middle of the month. Okay. So, so if I understand you correctly, okay. It depends on the month because in the, in the vocabulary for this chapter where it talks about edus and eduum, yep. it says 13th comma 15th. And so, what that means is it depends on the month. Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yes. And in fact, uh, let's see, where is it? Do, 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 do. Ah, uh, let's see. Mensi pre, oh, mensi tertio, septem, octem, November. Let's see, where do we get to the eyes? December. I know it's in here someplace because we wrote it, or we read it last time. Dies duodecem nocte et sol. All right, where'd it go? I know it's in here. Uh, let's see, long long duo, mense. Well, it's not later. I thought it was in this first section, wasn't it? Uh, maybe it's in the next section. Uh, oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, dies mensus primus, the first day of the month, calende nominatur, or we would say calends, is called, is the first day of the month. Dies primus mensus januari, dicitur calende januarie, or the calends of January. Okay. Um, dies tertius decimus post calendos. Idus nominatur. Idus januarie dies tertius decimus est post calendas. So on, in January, the Ides fall on the 13th. Uh, and let's see, somewhere around here, let's see. Uh, tertius decimus is the 13th? 13th, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, the Ides of March is the quintus decimus. Got it. Uh, and um, okay, but so is March. Sorry, March, Marzio, Mayo, May, Julio, and October. The uh, the Ides are on the fifteenth. Uh, so 
The other thing I mentioned last time is, believe it or not, the church still uses that calendar, okay? Uh, in the official Latin liturgical manuscripts, and certainly the old prayer books as well, if you open them up, you will see, and hopefully you can see that, is the, is the calendarium. Uh, for sake of our convenience, they do list them 1 through 30, since this is January, or sorry, June. Uh, but over here, they have Collins, and then they count down to eventually to Edus, uh, or Edibus. I think it's Edibus, yeah, Edibus, plural. If you're trying to show us a, a picture of it, we're not seeing it. We're seeing the... So, oh, my goodness. Okay. Oh, I see what I did. Oh, interesting. All right. Sorry. My little green line isn't around that. All right, give me just a second. We shall add. Uh, okay, what else? P -do -do I hope that's all of them. There we go. And let me get there. That should be, yeah, there it is. Okay, should be able to see that. Yes? Wow. Yes, we see it, but it needs to be enlarged. Oh, all right. Guys are a lot of trouble, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, there it is. How's that? Much better. Okay. So here we have June, and I did June simply because it's the month of June, right? So you can see Callens, and then the four, three, he talked about the day before the knowns and the Ides was called Pridie, okay? And the day before Callens is also called Pridie. And the reason it's called Pridie is it literally means the day before. Uh, and I believe that's discussed in the text. So uh, this calendar is still used. I mean, this is from a modern liturg liturgy of the hours. Uh, they do list our the so, the number days that we're used to, uh, just as a matter of convenience. So so nona works just like edus. Uh, it depends on the month. It's the fifth day in June, but it's the seventh day in July. Correct. It is roughly halfway between the calends and the ides. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Well, okay, maybe not halfway. Well, you said roughly. Yeah, roughly. <laughs> A little more roughly than I thought. Um, and so it's uh, it's there. This, by the way, is from a Roman breviary. Uh, again, doing the same thing. Now, you might ask, well, what are these uh, Cyclus Epact and LD? Uh, uh, um, LD is uh, um, uh, Litera Dei, Letter of the Day. Yeah, Litera Dei, Letter of the Day. And what that means is, is if you know the year, let's say this is year A, then you know that that is, Every time you see an A, that is a Sunday. And if it's year B, well, then every B is a Sunday. And if it's year C, then every C is a Sunday. So this is actually a perpetual calendar, is what this is. Uh, you can open up the, uh, the, uh, the, the missal or breviary or whatever it is, and you can find your day. Uh, let's see, what are, we, what are we on here? We're June 27th, which is... Uh, uh, the day and the octave of St. John the Baptist on the old calendar. So you can see that uh, C, by extension, is a Thursday <laughs> this year. So that's a Thursday. All these Cs are Thursdays. And the, I don't want to get into the EPACs. That has to do with the 19-year cycle. Was it 19? Yeah, I thought it was 19-year cycle of the moon. Uh, no, it isn't. It's 19. Well, anyway, that has to do with the cycle of the lunar phases, and it will tell you when the full moon is and when the new moon is. 
And you say, well, why do they care about that? Well, that is the great, that is how we fix the date of Easter. Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. And that cycle repeats itself over a period of time. And um, I may throw that in in a future class. Just to... When I was teaching the teenagers, um, my, I just do the pre-confirmation year mm -hmm. of catechism. I said, you can go home and you can like impress your parents with this particular fact. <laughs> and that's how we discuss why Easter never falls on the same day every year. Yep. So. Yep. And the sad thing was uh, there was a video of this guy going around and asking people what day Easter was, <laughs> meaning, you know, Monday through Sunday. And, and, you know, there are people that, I don't know. It's like, oh, good grief. <laughs> so, hey, it's our modern educational system. Uh, so anyway, this is still used. And I think I have another example. Oh, here's one out of the Roman Missal. Uh, that I picked. So anyway, those are all there. Um, so that's, yeah, as I said, it originally was kind of a nice, neat uh, structure, Alex, based on the moon, but the moon and the sun have different periods. And a lunar calendar is great because you can look up at the night sky. And if it's a half moon, then, you know, hey, that's been a week. Uh, if it's a full moon, it's been two weeks. If it's a new moon, it's been you know, new moon to new moon, it's been a month. So it was a really a great way to tell time. Uh, almost all the Mediterranean cultures had one, a lunar calendar. I, I don't know of any that didn't. But then, you know, you can't use that as to when spring is. You know, they, they knew that uh, when certain st stars rose, it was going to be a certain season. Or And also they knew when the sun... Uh, they, they knew the path of the sun against the stars because they measured it regularly. Uh, the Babylonians in particular measured it. So um, uh, they had to come up with a way to kind of keep the two in sync. And so today we're not really lunar calendar based anymore. Uh, we don't really care. Well, except for Easter, we don't care when the new moon is or the full moon. Or, well, I guess fishermen do, but I mean, it's it's not something that's a feature of our calendar. So they've lost some of that uh, uh, synchronicity, if you wish, between the days and uh, when they occur. So, but yes, March 15th is the um, Ides of March. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure how much Latin we're going to get done, but... Oh, well. All right. Um, let's see here. Let me, oh, let's close that and try and get back to, is there any other questions on the material? I, and I, I, we talked also about the, um, the sundial. Um, whoops, where'd it go? Oh, there it is. How, the at sunrise is the first hour of the Roman day. Sunset is the end of the 12th hour of the Roman day. And the answer is yes, the length of an hour changes uh, depending upon season. Now, the cool thing about that is you never have to worry about daylight savings time. So, uh, but if you're in physics and you need fixed length time units, then that's a problem. So, I have a question, and this is something sure. I, I picked up in a, somewhere else that I read this. When Jesus tells Peter before the cock crows, uh, you deny, deny me, yeah. the cock crow, I can't remember where I read it, was actually a term for like the early morning changing of the guard, and they would, I guess, make noise to announce that the, it was that time of the morning, like six in the morning or something um, like that. Well, I wouldn't put it quite that way. Yes, the cock crow is at dawn, pretty much. Okay. Uh, ask any farmer who raises chickens. <laughs> we had we had, we had reaches a crow all the time in our neighborhood. They finally got rid of the damn birds. Uh, yes, but they <laughs> probably didn't crow much at night. But boy, as soon as that sun picked up, they wouldn't shut up. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and yes, the changing of the guard would have occurred at sunrise. And the reason is they divided the day and the night into, um, let's see, was it four? Hold on, let me, uh, let me look here. I have to remember how to do this. Uh, whoops, I'm sorry here. I'm looking at something. Uh, let's see, four, 12. Yeah, okay. They divided the day into, the night, into four watches, three hours each. They also divided the day into three-hour watches. So the changing of the guard would be at the first, the first watch of the day is at sunrise, which is when the uh, roosters would uh, announce the new day. So, uh, so the Bible is referring to a literal rooster and not the changing of the guard. Um, or both. Both, really, because, I, okay, it would be, okay, they didn't go around with uh, watches. <laughs> Uh, you know, they, they, they didn't, basically their day was regulated, at least back then, by, by sundials. Uh, they did have water clocks, but those are, um, were not as accurate as a sundial, actually. Um, but that would have been understood that they were referring to the first hour of the day which is when the roosters crow and when the guard was was changed. So, uh, no, it's an accurate statement, but you don't don't think of one as the cause of the other. Correlation, not causation. Yes, correlate. Thank you. Yes, correlation. <laughs> correlation. All right, and now let's try and get to the next. Well, I'll just start here because we're not going to get very far. Oops, I thought I, oh, interesting. Why can't I select that? Let me close that. Let me reopen it. Oh, curious. Oh, I have to sign in again. Good grief. This thing has a very, oh, hold on. Uh, oh, dear. No, no, no. No, 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 no. I hope I'm not rubbing off on you. No, 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 no. Let me, um, let's see. I think this is open. All right, hold on. Let's do it this way. I'm just going to close this out. <sighs> there we go. Let's log out. Let us log back in. Go away, Google. I am not logging in with a Google account. All right, now let's go to chapter 13. And we're gonna do oops, this one. Whoop, too far. Okay, where are we here? Familia Romana, Familia Romana. Ah, here it is. Oh, Lexio Tertia, that's too far. Lexio Secunda, there we go. Oh, good grief. Man, I do, I really do have a license to drive this thing, believe it or not. There we go. Oh, it's still not highlighting. That's strange. Okay, I don't know what that's about. Oh, well. Uh, let me magnify it a little bit. There we go. Huh. So, nocta sol non lucet. Sol, sun, we had that. Luna, the moon. Nocta sol non lucet, said Luna, et stelle lucent, stelle, stella maris, I mean, you guys should know that one, luna ipsam suam lucem non habet, the moon itself has no light, or doesn't have its light, luna lune a sole venit, 
sorry, Lux Lunae. I read that wrong. I read that Luna Lunae, the, the moon of the moon. Lux Lunae, a sole venit. Light of the moon comes solely from the sun. Oh, sorry, comes from the sun. There's no sole in there. Itaqua luna non tam clara est quam sol. And so the moon is not as bright as the sun. Tam clara est quam. Where have we seen that I, construction? I get hung up on clara. I keep thinking clear, but it's bright. It's, um, one, of those, it's one of those words that I just got to. I will warrant it means both. Um, it can be a, you can say, uh, celum est clarum. The sky is clear, but it also means the sky is bright because when the sky is clear, it is bright. So, um, it makes uh, more sense to say bright. Yeah. Bright in this case, but it can mean, it can mean, um, Let's see, C L A R U S, Claudus. But, but who would say that the say moon is more bright? It can mean who, who would say that the moon is not as bright as this? It's not as clear as the yeah, sun. Yeah, yeah. You no, no. You you. What I'm saying is the Latin word can span both meanings. Certainly, when you go to English, you need to distinguish which that is. So, but see if you look here. Yeah, let's see. I do have. Oh, darn it! Sorry, I didn't share. Ah. My dictionary, excuse me. I missed it. All right, let's see here. So we got that one. Uh, we got that one. We got that one. Okay. Why isn't it sharing my dictionary? Oh, there it is. Okay, see? So Claudus can be clear or bright, okay? As opposed to obscurus or cacus. So... Um, in the in the Latin, in, you know, in the minds of the Roman, clear and bright are similar with one. Not so in English, but whoops, I missed my uh, there. So you can say clear, but change it to bright when we're talking about something like this. So you're only half right, is what I'm saying, Teresa. Sol est stella clarissima. Now we have the superlative again. The sun is the brightest star. Well, in the sky, this is true. Que luce sua et terram et lunam illustrant. Nequa tota luna sole illustratur. Sed tantum ea pars vertitur ad solum. So, what does, I can't select it, oh well, what does nequa tanta so, luna sole illustratur mean? Neither the all the light of the moon I'm, I'm, I'm lost there. Illustrator, that would be the passive. Right. I'm lost. Okay. That's why I asked. And neither Tota Luna, the whole moon, Illustrator. Is illustrated. Illustrated. Well, <laughs> Well, I don't. Let's go with illuminated. Illuminated. <laughs> by the sun. Now, what is illustratur? Do they have a nice, uh, I didn't see a nice word here. All right, let's jump over to our dictionary. Uh, illustratur. There we go. Illustro, okay? To light up, to make light, to illuminate. So illustratur is to illuminate. Now I'm having a hard time reading that small text. Does it also mean to show or to no nope. make make understood? No, no. Well, so it, it's only illuminating. Yeah, it, it in this case it's illuminating. The okay. reason we have the word illustrate 
is from the medieval manuscripts that when were the monks read the illustrated Bibles. Illustrated, yes. Okay. So, it, it it the text also uses the definition of made clear. Yes. Made clear. So, uh, Michael, could you go back uh, to the uh, clause that uh, preceded that Que luce sua et terram et lunum illustrat? Illustrat, yeah. So the first part of that is the sun is the brightest star. And then could you follow what it says? Which, que, illustrat, shines or illuminates the earth, the, sorry, the moon and the earth with its light. Lux and, is, and actually, it, it, when you said, well, that's in our skies, actually, that, that's a true statement. Yeah. It, when you when you uh, condition it with the which, yeah, an absolute statement uh, that uh, sol estella carissima that would not be correct. But when you qualify it by saying the quay, yes, then it's a correct statement. Well, it is still a the first part is still a correct statement from the standpoint of the Earth. You know, the sun is the brightest star. But if you star. are talking about the universe, then you... Oh, you yeah. No, then it's not even close. Make that statement. Yeah, but yeah. when you qualify it with the quay, it is. Uh, if you want to think of it that way, okay. I I, I, I don't quite see it that way. I, I realize, hey, the person writing this is from planet Earth. And we would say the sun is the brightest star in the sky, meaning from our viewpoint. So... Um, but certainly not absolutely in the uh, entire, uh, well, not even in the Milky Way for that matter. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, we're coming up on nine o'clock here. Uh, let's see. Do you, oh, okay. Uh, and uh, neither does, neither is the whole moon illuminated by the sun sed tantum ea pars quae vertitur ad solem. Anyone want to try a shot at that? Something about, let's see if I can get my eyes back on it, but only Aya, I guess, is referring to the moon because it's feminine. Yeah. It's only when her no quay, no no not her that that okay yeah okay you know um, me in pronouns I have issues well no <laughs> we all <laughs> especially nowadays yeah. <laughs> so it was something like okay at night if, if the you sun remember, is not okay. lit hold, hold on hold on you remember the is a uh, id right which you typically used as he she it. And is used in Latin as he, she, it. So don't don't mistake what I'm about to say. But from a purely grammatical sense, it would make more sense than they she. Are uh, no, no. They actually are adjectives. Okay. Um, I believe they're unemphatic demonstrative adjectives. Is the mouthful. Uh, I don't want to go down that path yet. But in this case, it is referring to this or that. It is referring to a particular part. So the ea, pars partis, is feminine, meaning part. And so that part, which, well, continue on. Just use a that and as opposed to with she. Okay. That, and which, vertitor. Now, is that referring to like being straight up or... I'm thinking it's related to the word vertical. No. No. Okay, then go on because um, turned towards the sun. Turned towards the sun. Oh, okay. The okay. other part is obscured. Yeah. Yep. Chatura pars obscura s. So, so, but only that part which is turned towards the sun. The all the other parts are obscured. obscured or yeah. dark. Right. Yeah, see, see, we would we would say obscured um, uh, means hard to see, 
but in the Roman mind, hard to see is because it's dark out. So, com exigua pars lune tantum videtur, luna nova esse dicitur. Oh boy, what is an exigua? Little, small. Um. Yeah, yeah, that would be yes. Ex exiguous harvus. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's almost at nine. Well, we'll just look up uh, exigua. Let's see if exigua. Did I spell that right? Yes, exigua. Scanty in measure. So parva, parvus parva would be um, little. Um, but exigua is even, shall we say, littler. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe minute would be a good translation of that. Uh, scantily, very little, uh, petty, short, poor, mean. It can also be an insult. So a, a little, a trifle. So they're really saying that when there's very little of the moon to be seen. Yeah, if you look below in that definition, it says trifle. Yeah. Uh, trifle. What? And, and the when you when you if you if you go back to the definition that you were looking at. Oh yes, yes. The second, the second paragraph yeah. of that definition. Yeah. Uses the term trifle. Yeah. So, uh, come exigua pars lune tantum videtur luna nova esse dicitur a new moon. It is called a new moon. Die septimo vel octavo post lunam novam luna dimidia videtur. So seven or eight days after the new moon, we see the half, half moon, dimidia. Half moon. Uh, um, cut in half. <laughs> Quae formam habet litere de. So it looks like Oh, yeah. Half moon is looks like a um, a D. D a quinto decimo post lunum novum luna plena est oh, et formum no. habet litera litere. Sorry. Oh, so there's the full moon. Is it always fifteen days? The well, yeah. The the okay from lunation to lunation, and what what is a lunation? That means. Um, from the same spot in the sky to the next time it comes around to the same spot in the sky is 29 and a half days. So it's not a nice, easy, round number. So if you take half of 29 and a half, you get uh, what? Um, 14, 20, 20, 14 and a half and a half. You get 14 and three quarters. Right. Close enough to 15. Yeah. So. All right. And I think we're out of time. Let's see how much we got a long way to go through this stuff. So I think I'll just stop it there. Anyway. Um, yeah. Do read this section carefully. The grammar is not that difficult. Um, there's not a whole lot. Of, in fact, if you look up uh, the biggest new grammar will be the uh, superlative. If we go back to here, let me close this up and we go back to chapter content and we look at the Latine Disco, which always tells you good stuff about what the chapter is about. Um, they go over the fifth declension again. Uh, we kind of had it in the last section, uh, but we've got it again. So it's uh, half half new. Uh, and with that, we now have all five declensions. And as I mentioned before, that's really very helpful because now you have all the forms of all the nouns. Um, there are a few irregular ones in there, um, like mane, morning. Mane is indeclinable. So Nominative, mane. Accusative, mane. Ablative, mane. Doesn't matter. Uh, so there are a few like those. 
So uh, they talk about the uh, adjectives are, are really the names of months are adjectives. Um, so Januarius, uh, well, mensis Januarius li literally means January month. Okay. We don't say that in English. We say month of January, but the Romans said uh, mensis Januarius, or the month is January. You could think of it that way. But they often used it standalone. So they may say uh, just Aprilis, September, October, November. They would use it. And, and we've seen the cases where if you, you can use an adjective as a noun. Uh, so there's nothing terribly um, new there. Um, there are, we do get when. Uh, we have the tempus uh, or, or the ablativus temporis, the ablative of time. If you're saying when, you use the ablative. If you are using how long, then you use the accusative. So centum annos vivera, to live for a hundred years. Um, so yeah, these are new things, but they're not things that you have never really encountered before. Uh, there is one thing, we now get the past tense of to be. Est is erat. Est, he, she, it is. Erat, he, she, it was. Sunt, they are. Erat, they were. And uh, we're going to pick up more tenses, which uh, we really need to, to dive deeper into some of the um, prayers and liturgy. Um, yeah, erat in principio. Yeah, we I've actually been sneaking it past you all these years. Or, uh, so... So there's not a huge amount of new grammar. So uh, do read through that. And the reason is, is because there's a lot of good um, detail on the calendar and telling time. Oops, I always overshoot by one. And all that other good stuff. And that is used in the Bible. That is still used in the Roman liturgy. It is still used in, in documents. And if you get an old document, uh, like a pretty book of the hours, then it will be used there. In fact, if you give me just a second, if you allow me to run over just a little bit, let me get something for you, just so you can see here. <sighs> Calendars. August? No, that's not a good one. April? No. Uh, hold on, just give me a second here. Is this the one? Oh, that's hard to read. All right, hold on. Uh, oh, Hildesheim. Yeah, that's a good set. All right, here we go. Whoops, wait a minute. Sorry, I got to get the... Where'd it go? Oh, originals. Okay. Uh, here we go. Oh, figures. It's not the right one. Why is it I can never find what I'm looking for, even though I was using it just the other day? What are you looking for? Uh, a calendar uh, from a medieval manuscript. Well, I'm looking for a good example is, is the problem. Uh, no, it figures they've all decided to hide somewhere else. Uh, let's see here. Is this in that 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 whole 27 page handout? Um, oh, yeah. I'll say uh, actually, no, let me uh, let me go to that. I'll, I'll come back to the calendar later. Other than to say, use, uh, you're going to run into that calendar stuff in the future. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, the two handouts. Okay. Um, we agreed last time. Uh, you weren't here, Alex, but uh, it was put to vote and everybody agreed. And let me do a new share here. There. Uh, there we go. Uh, I have had this table of Latin endings and very, you know, um, for a long time. I did this for myself ages ago. 
and I was sort of getting tired of reproducing the tables in the charts. And so what I am going to, and also the problem is, is if I would add a new table to one of the charts, then you would have to go hunt for that table. So we are now transitioning to the complete set of tables. So if you go to, and it has more than what you need actually. So if we go to adjectives, comparative, uh, you have the longior, longius, the plural, and then you have the uh, superlatives, the comparatives and the superlatives. So there are tables in here for that particular set of grammar that we learned. Uh, we also have some irregulars uh, as well that I added to my list. And so uh, if you want to know how to do a first Let's see, let's say, okay, here we go. You want to do a first declension noun. That's the model. Vita, vitam, vitae, vitae, vita. And I've done nominative and accusative like the book, um, which I don't like. I prefer no, no. Genitive, but that's the way <laughs> the book is. So I'm gonna to have to modify this, Michael. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm a nominative genitive. A nominative genitive. Well, I'll tell you, if everybody votes to go back to to nominative genitive and accusative. No, it's nominative genitive dative. Accusative. Or dative, excuse me. Yeah. Nominative, yeah. Dative. I'm with Alex on that. Well we had this we had this discussion last week, Alex. I know, I know. But that, but keep in mind that we that you guys had Collins and Collins yeah. did it the right way. But Collins is not the only one that does it that oh, way. Oh no, that his oh no, historically the okay, the Latin grammarians did it in that order. That order goes all the way back to ancient Rome when they talked when the Latin grammarians talked about their language. They listed it in that order. But but Michael, I want to just congratulate you. This is this is terrific. Yeah. Cuz right. I've got the the old guides that are you know, much shorter and not as comprehensive. This is terrific. So we're going to do it's this. It's a lot of work and we do appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it's less work than you might think. Well, I mean, yes, it is a lot of work total, but I did it over many years. So not that much. Uh, I will wait until Sophia comes back and Laura comes back. I know Laura's on vacation. I'm not sure what happened to Sophia. Uh, it's possible they went to the Mass tonight. I do feel badly about not going to the Mass since it is the Feast of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And I have had a long devotion to her since as a child. But uh, on the other you hand, did a I great, you did a great job covering it. I, yeah, I figured A, I'll cover it. And B, I canceled so many classes because of schedule interruptions. I thought, ah, all right, I'll, I'll stick with it. So, um, so anyway, it's all there. Um, there is extra. There is stuff you do not need to know yet. If we go to conjugations, I really don't want to terrify you yet. But here are the active and passive, singular, plural, and the present, imperfect, future, and of the first and second and third person. So, um, uh, and not only that, we have the indicative, and then we have something that we've really never gotten to, and that is the subjunctive. I do hope we can eventually get to the subjunctive. Um, maybe not, but the imperative, you've had that. The infinitives, you had that. And some of this other stuff uh, you've not had yet. So there is a lot in here um, that you haven't had. Most of it, though, you have seen. And I plan as I run into things in the uh, Familia Romana to add it, uh, both uh, for my reference and for um, for you guys. So. That well, the great thing is it comes, you don't have to swallow it all at once. You, yes. you get the reading and the uh, and the textbook that goes with it. So you get it in small portions. Yeah. And this is where I discuss pronouns. Okay. There are only first person singular and plural and second person singular and plural pronouns in Latin. There are no third person pronouns. Uh, and that's what I was alluding to. Is, ea, id, he, she, it. Um, they're actually unemphatic demonstrative pronouns or adjectives. 
So you can say he, she, it, or that one. Um, I should probably add a little more information on that one of these days. Would the emphatic be like the ipsus and those things? No, the ipsus, the ipsa means it's, uh, ipsa is uh, itself. Or, yeah, or ipsum. Ipso facto, by the fact itself. So, different. Could you repeat that statement again about the, the only the first and second? There are only it, only first and second personal pronouns. Personal okay. pronouns. Right. Right. These so, are actually adjectives. But again, we can use an adjective to stand in for the place of a noun, right? We've seen that before. Uh, sed libera nos amalo, but deliver us from evil. Well, malos malamalam is an adjective, you know. Um, but we can, and in fact, in English, evil is an adjective. The evil angels, evil is, is an adjective. Uh, deliver us from evil. Now evil is a standalone noun. And the similar thing happens in Latin is that adjectives can stand alone as their own nouns. Uh, if you wanted to be technical, you might say the evil one on that uh, thing on the end, on the said libra no somalo. But, it, but likewise, anyway, is ea id can also be an adjective and it basically does not mean he, she, or it. It means that one. Uh, so I, if uh, when we came across it in the uh, Familia Romana, we translate it as, as that, as I recall, or this. Um, it's a little bit different from the he, k, cock, which really is this. We're going to see more of this later, by the way. So if you're kind of confused, don't worry. We will clarify that a little bit better in the future. And the Familia Romana does hint at this in a number of places. I'll, I'll see if I can uh, look up where it was hiding. Um, I know it was in a past lesson, but it was kind of hidden in the sense it was not immediately obvious. So just thought I'd mention that. Anyway, so there it is. Um, and as I said, I'll add to it. The other one, which I threw in the list, was the Memorari. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this is actually from my PDF file. You can think of this as my prayer book. Uh, I wanted to share the section on it because there are additional details in here. Um, the uh, ad sanctitatis tuae pedes dulcissima virgo maria is given. There we go. This is the prayer that is from the Antidotarius anime. Um, I took it from a 1518 edition, Paris edition. Um, now, it just so happens that in that edition, it uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the part in brackets, which uh, here, let me zoom that up. Where are the brackets? Uh, yeah, noli ver mater verbi mea despicera, so, which is an important part of the uh, of the memorari. Actually, it occurs in a different edition, the uh, precat precationum encaridian. Uh, I'm probably one of the few people that read prayer books and liturgy books as a, as a uh, form of recreation. But. Um, my sisters claim my mother dropped me on my head at a tender age, but you know, I, I can neither confirm nor deny that. But anyway, here's the prayer: Ad sanctitatis tuae pedes dulcissimi virgo Maria. So here's actually the whole thing, and you can see that in the middle, memorari piissima non esse auditum a seculo, quemquam a tua carentem presidia, ot tua potentem suffragia a te derelictum. Very close. 
Tali Animatus Conferencia Ante Virgo Maria Confugio. Ante curo, ante venio, corante gemens et tremens assisto. I stand uh, weeping before thee and trembling um, at your assistance. So anyway, um, you can see what that is. So I included that in. And if uh, you can uh, cut out the, uh, the let's see, what, where I put it? Do, 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 do. Oh, there it is. You can cut that out and paste it on your mirror or something. So uh, I threw that in as well. So anyway, so let's uh, work on chapter, well, still chapter 13, parts two and three, par secunde tertia. As I said, do, do study this chapter. Not a lot of new grammar. It uses all of the grammar you've had to this point. So if you're weak in, in past grammar, then, well, uh, better study now and work through the, uh, the vocabulary because a lot of that vocabulary you will see in the Bible and in the liturgy in one form or another. So keep that in mind. Any last minute questions? Michael, uh, next Thursday is the fourth. Is that right? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, hold on. Let me switch my share. Usually I have a, all of these shared and I don't have to worry about it. There we go. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're going to skip the, the 4th of July. Yeah. So with that in mind, I will mute everybody and we will do our oratio finalis. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum. Adveniat renium tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in celo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amal. And so with that, we are at the end of the formal class. Stop.